I have a very short introduction here. Um, I uh, contacted the Center for Inquiry in Hollywood, Center for Inquiry West, about the speaker that I'd heard of, and they said she filled the joint up there, and she was interrupted several times with standing ovations, and of all the people that had spoken at their place on, Holly, uh, on uh, Hollywood Boulevard, uh, she, just, she, she was the best of the bunch. She really, really turned the crowd on, had a good time, and so I, I thought if she's that good, we'd like to get her down here. I found out that she was on a million, no, a billion year mission for her own organization, the, the Scientology group. She's gonna be gone for a billion years, but I think we're so honored that she cut that short by <laughs> 999,999,000 years. 970 years just to talk to us. So, I should have written that out. I don't know if I came close on it. So if you don't pay attention, you're missing out on something because this is one very special lady. She was a Scientologist for 30 years and is here to tell us who it was, what it was like, and you know, uh, well, just tell us about Scientology. I'd like to introduce Miss Tori Christman. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. It's good to see all of you. My name is Tori Christman. I was in Scientology for 30 years. I literally escaped out in 2000. And before I start, I want to ask a couple of questions. First of all, is there anyone in the audience who is a Scientologist? Anyone who's from the Office of Special Affairs? Okay, good, that's good. Usually they send people, I was one of the people I used to send to try to disrupt meetings, and so that's why I asked, because I want to let you know, you know, if anybody's here for that intention, I will ask them to leave, and I've already talked to Keith about it, that's the way it is. But they've come to a few meetings, yes, sir? You would, wouldn't you? But they're chronic liars. So <laughs> that, that's, you know, and the frightening thing about Scientology is that you don't know you're a liar. I mean, I really, I was such a liar. That's why I woke up. I'll get to that. But anyway, I'll get to it. But anyway, first of all, um, a couple things I want to let you guys know. Most of the Scientologists I know, in all honesty, are very nice people. I like them a lot. I still like them to this day. They're good people. And I call it the Truman Show, right? Have any of you seen that movie? Raise your hand if you have. Yeah? Okay, good. So it's very much like that. You can't see the walls when you're inside, right? But David Miscavige and some of the executives that run it are running these really creepy programs. And I'm going to tell you about that, too. So that's kind of what helped me wake up, because they invited me into one of their really creepy programs. And thinking I'd go along with it, which I did for a long time until I found out the truth, and then there you go. But I'll get to it. Okay, so then the last thing is that these are based, this talk is based on my personal experiences of 30 years in Scientology and my own opinions. Because I have to say that because they're legal and they're always trying to sue somebody, right? But if it's my own opinions, I have a right to say them, right? So there you go. Okay, good. So first of all, I got in in 1969. My parents are college graduates. My grandparents are college graduates. They're really big on college. I was kind of in and out of college. It, 60s were the hippies. You know, I became a hippie. I got into drugs. They had moved from, I was in Hillary Clinton's graduating class in Park Ridge, Illinois, north of Chicago. And then they moved up to Lake Forest, which is a very wealthy, it's kind of like the top, top wealthy people live there, right? And unfortunately, a lot of them were really snotty. Their kids, at least, were really snotty, nasty people. And I was like, this can't possibly be it. So I started on my own little quest to find something higher, right? And that was really how I got in Scientology, because I started studying, looking, got into drugs, started doing grass. Okay, maybe this is it. That was pretty cool. LSD. You know, then, now you're surrounded by a bunch of kids, and they're like, hey, try speed, try that. Shooting up speed, tried that. You know, just one thing after another. We were in Haight-Ashbury with the doors and the stones, and, and I ran into Grace Slick about a month ago. 
she, or two months ago, she was in Hollywood, and I told her my story. She said, I can't believe it. You came all, you know, full circle. Because I told her, I said, I was in a cult for 30 years. You know, I knew you in Haight-Ashbury, and now here I am. But anyway, it's, it's kind of a tricky thing. So I ended up shooting up heroin once, which Scientology has said, since I left, I am not only a heroin addict, but I'm a heroin dealer, right? Which I'm here to tell you, no, that's completely not true. They've made up thousands of lies about me, on and on and on, since I left, since the day I left, since I wouldn't go back. But um, I got sick. I got hepatitis from it. My parents flew me back to Lake Forest, and these two kids from high school came in with a Dianetics book. I have it here. This is the book they gave me, Dianetics. They gave me this book, right? See, I got all my little tabs and everything. I was into it, right? And they said, oh, you can have it. Keep it. And I thought, wow, that's really nice. They give me this book, right? And that's really how a lot of people get into Scientology. They either read a book or they've got their little phony stress test. Come on, sit down. It's just a little test. You know, see if you're stressed out. How many people in this room can say you're not stressed out? Right? I mean, we all in one. Oh, you can't. Okay, good. We got one guy. <laughs> Most of us in this day and age, we all are, right? But that's their little phony thing. They used to have a personality test where they would actually go through and find out your own what they called buttons, right? And then from that, they would just keep pushing that button and saying, it's a chance Scientology could fix that, right? So they either do a seminar now, the free stress test, a book, one of their friends. Now they have a bunch of front groups, which you probably have some down here. Narconon, which is supposed to help drugs, doesn't. Not too much. They don't, that's pretty bad. Criminon helps the prisoners. They, they have way to happiness where they go around and rope in doctors, dentists, and try to get them to pay for their books, which is basically the Ten Commandments, but Hubbard rewrote it. And they're just like, you know, tell the truth, stuff like that. All the things they violate, they've got in the, in the way to happiness, right? <laughs> so they've got these little front groups, right? Those, that's another way. And the other one is WISE, which is World Institute of Enterprises International. I think that's it. Does that sound right? WISE or Enterprises. Scientology, World, Inter World Institute of Scientology Enterprises. Okay, thank you. So anyway, that's like business. They'll say, oh, you've got a business. We can help three times your statistics. You know, give us 50 grand. We'll do it. And, you know, you can really go down to Barnes & Noble and get, you know, a business book and, for 20 bucks and get the same stuff. But they're really good at what they do. That's what they do. They find out your little button, and then they're like, and so you think, to me, this is my analogy. It's sort of like a mind control train, right, where... You get on it just thinking, okay, I'll do a course, right? It's 40 bucks, right? It's not that much. But then you get on the train and just think of if all you guys were in the room going, what is your name? What's your name? Ellie. So Ellie, just think of all these people going, what are you thinking of? You can't, you, so you finish the communication course. There's 50 more cars before you even get to clear. You know, come on and talk to them and talk to them and Tom Cruise and John Travolta. And everyone asks, like, why are they in it? Well, it's a lot like the Truman Show. Remember, they got in it, same as anybody else. They read a book. Everyone has hope, right? You, have, you want to believe in something. It's like, that's the way it is. But once you get in, you can't really get out. And it's a lot like a triangle, right? So you're moving up this. Like a lot of people get in here, they might read a book, and they leave. But then the guys that stay in, they get more and more. A, you're kind of getting the red carpet treatment. Of course, you're paying for it, thousands and thousands of dollars. But everything's top secret, right? You know, Hubbard originally wrote the Dianetics, this book. And he said, when I was in college, I read it. I read about three chapters. And he said, the original Dianetics said, you have the analytical mind, which is like a computer, it's just storing information every day. And then you have the analytical or the reactive mind, which is if you have any pain or unconsciousness, all that's said or done in that incident is recorded. And then that can react on you. And he said you can erase your reactive mind, right? Now you notice, have any of you ever heard their anti-psychiatry thing? Have you seen that? No Pardon me? No Right, they have no, I mean, I have epilepsy. I don't know if I still do, because I haven't, I've, haven't had seizures in 20 years, but when I was in, they made me get off my medicine, and I was having horrible seizures, and thank God my mother said, they're going to kill you. You know, you're going to get back on your medicine. From that, they declared 
my mother a suppressive person? Now, when you're declared a suppressive person, you've got two choices. They can either disconnect from you, in which case you never talk to your parents again, or your husband or wife or anybody who's critical of Scientology, or you can do a thing called good roads and fair weather, where you're just like talking about good roads, talking about fair weather, that kind of thing, right? So my mother and I basically for 30 years talked about the weather. That was it. You know, and she would send me the Time Magazine article, and I'd throw it away. I, and, you know, and, you th and people say to me all the time, but I, that would never happen to me. I would never do something like that. But that's not true. I've talked to academics who've studied cults, and they say anybody can get in a cult. If you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, anybody can. And often people that are members of cults are from a regular family. You know, they're not, people think, oh, they're really stupid or something. They're not. Actually, they're very, often higher intelligence. They're looking for a better way in life, right? But then once you get in it, you think it's your decision, and they're always saying it's a big dichotomy where they sell freedom, but they enslave you. They sell communication, but they hide, right? We've, we're just picketing. Have any of you heard of Anonymous? Yeah? Good. Okay, well, that's a really cool thing. This year, no? Okay, well, this year, Andrew Morton, you've heard of Princess Diana, right? So Andrew Morton wrote the book on her, right? And then he decided to write a book on Tom Cruise. And it was going to come out in January, and it did come out in January, on Tom Cruise. And at the same time the book came out, somebody leaked that video. Has anybody seen that video of Tom Cruise on the Internet where it's like you're either in or you're out? Well, type it in sometime on, on, on the Internet, and you'll see. He's, he really looks kooky, right? And Scientology did their typical thing of ordering it off the net, saying, no, you know, take it off. Well, a bunch of people that are... They call themselves anonymous. They're, they're internet people. And they all said, not on our watch. And they basically shut down their computer. I mean, their, their website, right? And they didn't hack it. It's like if you were going to go get on a bus and 100 people went on ahead of you, it would stop. And that's what happened, right? And they made a video saying to Scientology different stuff. Then we did a protest. All across the world, there were 10,000 people protesting. It was really, really cool. That was the first one in February. And you can type it in February 10th plus anonymous and see it. It's really cool. It's amazing. Every state, you know, I think there were 17 countries. Ath is an anonymous person. Stand up. Here he is. Give him a hand. And how many, how many, how many cities were there? Uh -huh. Over a hundred cities, and, and a lot of them are at age, you know, young people getting up and standing up. It's really, really cool. I'm really impressed with it. And for all of us who've been, you know, kind of like fighting their abuses, most of the people that are against them are not against, even though you all have heard about Xenu, right? How many people in here have heard of Xenu? A lot, right? Scientology, they start out in the beginning, they've got their communication course, then they have a thing called grades, where it handles your problems, communication, stuff like that. But right away when you get in, they also, hang on, I brought it, I forgot to get it out. Let me see. Okay, here it is. They also have a thing called keeping Scientology working, right? And every single course you do, you have to read keeping Scientology working, okay? And part of it is knowing the technology, knowing it's correct, teaching it correctly, applying it correctly. But then he goes into this whole thing about how all organizations that have failed failed because basically people didn't hammer out of existence incorrect technology, right? And knocking out incorrect application and closing the door on any possibility of incorrect technology. So it's sort of like right away you get onto this thing of like, wow, I better get it together, or your freedom is really at you know, jeopardy. And all these other people are agreeing with you. Now, if you have a disagreement on keeping Scientology working, you're sent to ethics, and they sit you down, or cramming, which is correction, and they say, you know, what word don't you understand here? And it's either a word or you've done something bad. That's it in Scientology. So you've either got to come up with something that you've done, or you're connected to someone like me, a suppressive person. So there you go. So that's keeping Scientology working, which every single course they do. So they're all, they've got all these different little charts of things that you're learning when you get in it. They're all, you know, the administrative thing. And they're always kind of evaluating where are you on all these charts, right? And where is the person? They call, all of you in this room are called WOGs, which stands for, he said, Hubbard said, wise old gentleman. But I found out since I left, it's really kind of a racist term from Africa. 
But they say it in a very put-down way anyway. It's like, oh, he's just a wog. You know, or, oh, yeah, my boss, he's a wog. You know what I mean? They're just really, they really degrade everyone but them. And that's part of a cult. It's like us versus them, right? So does anyone have a question first before I go on? Yeah? Yes? Uh, I don't know if this is your plan uh, to do so, but you've asked if people are familiar with certain topics. If, could you give just a Scientology for dummies for people who are not familiar with the term of Xenu and, and things like that? If, if you do that? Good question. All right, so here it is. This is Scientology for dummies. Give me your money. <laughs> <laughs> That's really what it is. You know, they, they, they sell hot air, they ask, they charge a lot of money for it. Now you get higher on the thing, it's more stuff, it's more money. Now you get higher, it's all top secret. You can't know about it. Your best friend, this conversation we're all having, I never had with one of my friends, with my husband of 27 years. Because you're not allowed to talk about it. If you do, you're off to ethics. But honestly, to be fair to you, you know, it starts out with the communication course. Just about everybody does that. And, and a lot of the critics are against the communication course because they say that's the beginning of brainwashing. I still am sort of for it. I think it's a good little course, but maybe I'm still brainwashed. Hang on a second. So there's communication. Then they have grades, which is handling problems, communication, things like that. And that costs more money. Or you can co-audit, where like you would audit me, I would audit you kind of thing. We'd trade off. You can do that. But a lot of people just buy it. D is this related to that, or, or, or do you have a different question? Just a comment I had about the rule of law. Yes. It was British slang for anybody from East of Suez. Who what? Anybody from East of Suez was a wall with water. So it is racist, right? Oh, yeah. It's racist. Yeah. It has to do with the dark skin, the Indian. Good. So that's what I thought. It's racist. That's what I've heard. So thank you. Wily oriental gentleman. That's wise old gentle, or oriental gentleman. Yeah, that, yeah. But anyway, it isn't. It's really, it's really a put down is what it is. Okay, so you've got your communication course, then the grades. Then the thing people start working for is clear, which is part of Dianetics. See, the end phenomena of Dianetics originally was you're going to have a perfect memory, a perfect IQ, no pains. It's sort of like Cocoon. How many saw that movie? Yeah. Right? You know, you're like, woohoo, we're young, we don't have any problems, right? Well, what happened was Hubbard in his first clear at the shrine turned around and he said, what's the color of my tie? She couldn't remember it. Now, he's a science fiction writer, right? And he's a con man. He was a good con man. My, my husband's parents were in in 1950. And I, and I will say, in all fairness to him, they had great stories to tell about him. I mean, he was a fun guy. She used to always call him a rascal. You know, he wasn't like this Nazi Germany stuff that DM is really the head of it now, David Miscavige, is kind of running. He, had, he was more charismatic, so more people wanted to hang with the guy, right? And give him money and follow him. But now the clear thing doesn't work, so now what? So he comes up with this thing, operating Phaetons. And he changes from Dianetics because of the IRS to Scientology, which is a religion, right? And once he got that religious status, now he's got protection. Plus, he moved out onto the ocean. Somebody asked me earlier to tell about the Sea Org. Well, that's what the Sea Org was. Hubbard moved out onto the ocean to get away from anybody who could nail him. Now he's out on a ship with a bunch of young kids, you know, in the Commodore's Messengers Org and all this stuff, right? <laughs> but you can, and you can type it in and go see it in the internet. But it's one of those things where they're out on the ocean, he's calling it the Sea Org. It's got a lot of like, ooh, the Sea Org, right? You know, it's kind of mysterious. Like probably most people in this, in this room, does anybody know what Scientology is? No. That, I've been out for eight years. Every person I've ever talked to goes, I don't know what it is. You know why? Because Hubbard designed it that way. It's a, he used to say, create a mystery sandwich, right? And then they're going to want to come in and find out. So it's intentional that you don't know what it is. And plus, if you really knew what it was, you wouldn't come, right? <laughs> so that, it's those two things. So Hubbard, after Clear, when that didn't work, came up with operating Thetan. Thetan is a spirit, or you as a spirit, and operating is whatever you think that to be, right? Now, you guys mentioned proof, that you guys are into proof. Well, proof for Scientology is, like, unbelievable. I mean, you ask for proof, you're out to ethics, honey. Something's wrong with you. You're critical of Scientology. What's wrong? 
what, what proof do you need? Here I am, right? You can't question them. That's the thing. You, you get into it and people go, but I wouldn't do that. And it's like, I wouldn't either. I was a free speech advocate. But when you get on this train of mind control and you're surrounded by these peers, you just start moving along. It's really weird. It's a really strange thing. So now on the 101, Scientology for Dummies, so now you've got clear, now you've got OT1, 2, and 3. OT1 and 2, I'm not even going to waste time talking about. OT3 is where it enters into Xenu, which is, now this is such a weird story, I can never even remember it. It's so strange. But when I got on it, because people go, how could you believe that? First of all, you have to remember, when I got in in 69, there was no internet. So you don't have access to this information, right, at all. And in Scientology, if anybody left and told it, they were declared suppressive, you could never talk to them again. Now, you might think, what is that suppressive thing? Well, I brought it so you could see it. I'm not going to hand it out because I put it on TV and stuff, but here it is. Here's my suppressive declare. And they literally do this. They declare someone as suppressive. It says, you know, Tori Bazazian, that was my married name, of Los Angeles, California, is hereby declared a suppressive person. And it goes on and on. They just make up. Hubbard said, if you don't have lies, if you don't have bad deeds to tell about somebody, make them up. So that's what, these are just made up junk about me, right? And at the back, my only terminal is the international justice chief, right? Now, I didn't even know this happened. Mark Bunker, who I forgot to introduce, thank you very much for Zenu TV. There he is. He... The first video I did when I left, I escaped out, and I made this video in Boston. I didn't make it. I wasn't going to do a video. I said, I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to do speeches. I'm not going to do picket. I'm not going to do anything. But then I talked to so many families who lost their, their loved ones that I said, you know, I've got to do something. So I went into the Boston org to try to just talk to them and say, why don't you come talk to these two critics, right? And they were filming me, right? You know, they had their camera on me. And every time I'd talk, you can go see it. It's called Magoo Dancing in Boston. Mark made it. It's a really cute film. But they're filming me. And you can see they're just like completely out of communication. And I'm there. I've only been out two weeks. And I'm like, come on. You know, Scientology is about communication. You know, come on. Come talk to them. And they're just like filming away. And I finally say to Bob, oh, I'm hot. And he goes, it's hard work being expressive, Tori. <laughs> He was a very funny person. He is a funny person. Okay, so he says, look, just go in the van, turn on the air conditioning, and relax, right? So I sit in the van. Now, the guy's across the street, right, with the camera on me. And I kinda, I've only been out two weeks. I kind of wave at him like, hey, man, I was with you guys two weeks ago, right? But he still keeps coming, comes all the way over, puts his camera right on the window, which isn't in the video, but he does. And that was it for me. Boom! It was just like, that's it. I have a limit. You just hit it. You know what I mean? I have a voice, and I have free speech, and I'm going to go talk. And I come over, and I go, hey, Andreas. And that's, that's the beginning of me speaking out. I wasn't going to before that. But that's what they do. They push people, just like Ath. I mean, Gareth, right? That's my real name. His real name is Gareth. He was anonymous. These anonymous kids, you'll see pictures of them. You're going to see them. And they all wear Guy Fox masks, right? That's what you call them? Yeah, and they wear them because they don't want Scientology to know their identities. Because identity, and we said to them when they started, "Be careful, they're going to follow you." Didn't I? I told you last week they're going to follow you. They're going to be after you. That you know, I just know that. Hang on, yeah. I'm just wondering if these uh, formerly anonymous kids have had repercussions in their personal life. Yes. Their well, this is—he just did a whole interview on it, a seven-page interview that you can see on the internet because we did a picket. And at the picket, Scientology, first of all, they have a giant Tom Cruise video through the whole thing. They, they had hired huge speakers, like almost two-story speakers on both ends of their street, blasting away. And every time Mark and I would do a video, they'd jack it up, right? And then they have a picture, a big thing of Ath, or Gareth, with his name, photograph. He lives down here. Phone address, phone number, everything. Yeah, they follow, they follow you around. They're really, really, that's the dark side. But you see, you see, you think, well, I wouldn't stay if I knew that. But most Scientologists do not know that that's going on. They don't. And so they're like, oh, I was that way. And I work for the Office of Special Affairs, which is like, they told me it was PR and legal. But really, it's PR, legal, and their dirty tricks. But I didn't know that. And when I finally woke up, I woke up in 2000, 
when I finally woke up, if you just think of a black sheet, that's how much I was positive. Hubbard wrote a thing called Fair Game. He said you can lie, cheat, steal, destroy someone utterly if they're an enemy of the Church of Scientology. But I was, I stood up in court saying, that's not true with Margaret Singer. I did. I, that's not true. We don't do fair grave. She's lying. You know, I was positive it wasn't true. But it turns out that at the bottom of the original thing, it says this does not apply to suppressive people. Remember, I'm a suppressive person now, right? So they can lie, cheat, steal, destroy me utterly. Right? But it, they'd whited it out. So that didn't say that. So I was positive they didn't do fair game. Now, you have to remember where I was, because I forgot. Where was I? Just kind of explaining. Zenu. Yeah, Zenu. Okay, so we're getting to Zenu. All right. So did, how many people saw the South Park issue? Okay, good. If you haven't, first of all, South Park is exactly what it is. Exactly. That is what they believe. That's what Tom Cruise believes. That's what John Travolta believes. I think... Will Smith has now woken up. We have an expression, don't get Tom Cruised, right? Because it's not good for your career, as we've seen with Mr. Tommy Cruise. But um, I always thank him. Thank you, Tom Cruise. You know, I, I'll tell you, the German TV flew over here, and I said, I want to thank Tom Cruise, because he jumped on Oprah's couch, right? And then he made, put down Brooke Shields, and then he told Matt Lauer, I know the source of psychiatry. You don't, right? I mean, here he is. Mr. Actor now turned a doctor, right, overnight. And so, and I don't like that, because remember, they took me off my medicine. So for me, personally, I, 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 but I, when he did that, I just went bingo. Because I've been writing on the internet saying to the head of Scientology, karma's going to come your way. And whether you guys believe in karma or not, I, it, that's fine, but I do. And I thought, you just can't keep hurting people. And they were hurting me, flattening my tires, doing stuff to my friends, Barb, stuff like that. And I said, you can't keep doing stuff like that and not have something come back your way. And I told him, I said, I promise you it's going to be something you least expect. And when Tom Cruise did that, I was like, yes. <laughs> and sure enough, the media started calling me that night. I mean, my phone was ringing off the hook. CNN came the next day to my work, Inside Edition, German TV. But when German TV flew over here, they're interviewing me. And I said, I'd like to really thank Tom Cruise. And she turns off all the lights and she says, look, I know you're being sarcastic. I said, let's get something perfectly clear here. I am not being sarcastic. Tom Cruise, before he did that, the media were terrified of Scientology. They would not interview us. I mean, we were critics. I was an ex-Scientologist. They were like, mm-mm, don't want to get into the legal issue of it. But it was almost like Toto and the Wizard of Oz where he pulled the curtain back and said, this is what I look like. And they were like, what is that? And I was like, well, I can tell you, I was on the same level he was on. I know what happened to him at least in my opinion. So anyway, I, I thanked him. And if you notice back then with Katie and Tom, there was always a girl right between them, right? And that's Rebecca, who is a Sea Org member, right? And she's there to report up to David Miscavige what's happening with Katie, because they're trying to get this whole thing going, right? And I, they said, what happened, what'll happen to Katie if she leaves? And I said, well, you know, I left and I lost all my friends of 30 years and I looked in the camera and I said, and my husband of 27 years. My husband called me up that night and he says, I never left you, you left me and you had an affair. And I said, who did I have an affair with? Right? And he just went on and on, rattling on all this stuff. And all of a sudden I realized this is an OSA thing, which is the Office of Special Affairs. And I said, you know what? Our friend, Bill Yachty, works for the Office of Special Affairs as a volunteer. And I had helped him. And I said, you can tell Bill you ought to go to hell. Because I know where you are. And let's get something straight here. My front door is open. You can walk in my house tonight. I don't know where you live. I don't know where you work. You won't talk to me. So don't say, I left you. And you know what he says? Well, my wife and I want peace. I said, your wife? <laughs> you know, it was like, we, had, we were divorced. But I didn't know he was married. But that's how they are. They won't even call and say, I got married. I found out his mother died on the internet. Somebody said, rest in peace, Flo Bizazian. And I'm like, I called him up, rest in peace? Your mother died and you don't have enough guts to call me up and say your mother died? I was just, it's amazing to me that the stuff they will do, if you're a declared suppressive, you're just like worse than Phil. Yeah. A lot of cults have more of a physical kind of, you know, campus, so to speak. You know, it right. sounds like Scientology is more successful at kind of being the university without walls to some extent. 
you know, but, uh, yeah, but, it's, but it seems, I mean, like, yeah, gold they, see, they have, they do have, you have to remember, they have the Sea Org, then they have staff, then they have the public. So for the public, you're right, because we're we live in houses, we don't live with them. Do you see what I mean? Right. But you always have to they're always getting you back to their base. Do you see what mm -hmm. I mean? You've always got to be on course or getting auditing or donating or buying books. There's always something that's going on to keep you into it. So by the time I finally woke up, and I'm trying to think of the time, where are we at on the time? Three hours? <laughs> <laughs> no, really. You've got plenty of time. You're doing well. Yeah? Okay. Can I ask you one question? No, could, no. <laughs> could you perhaps explain to the, this, the audience here what is clear in the Scientology? Because that's part of the fundamentals. Of the, the clear, okay, is what I said. You erase your reactive mind. You, what he said is you have mental image pictures. He said we all have mental image pictures that are stored. And within them, and they're moments of pain and unconsciousness. Those are in the reactive mind, right? And they're mental image pictures that have electrical charge in them that they show reads on their e-meter, right? And that's how they get you kind of hooked, because it's like they do kind of read. And it's like, well? Describe the e-meter and the auditing process, maybe. Okay, so the e-meter, have you all seen the e-meter? It's like a lie detector's test, which they get very offended by because they say, it's a religious artifact, it's not a lie detector. <laughs> yes? Exactly. Would you like to describe it? Well, basically, I mean, I, I can tell you that what you have is the person becomes... Stand up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, was the, the, when I was in graduate school, we had, which were not really sophisticated, but you had uh, a person become part of a circuit, and what the device does is it measures the resistance across the circuit. And when you are aroused, uh, what it's picking up is the fact that you're sweating. And the resistance drops when you sweat. Right. And so you get a spike on this meter. Now, the curious thing is that that response, the psychogalvanic skin response, habituates very quickly. So if you keep you know, you, you talk to somebody, I, I have one that I played with, I remember one of my colleagues, I knew was having an affair. And I had him <laughs> holding on to this thing. And I said, oh, here comes so-and-so, which was the husband of the woman who was married. <laughs> and the thing went, like, <laughs> <laughs> But if I kept doing that, it would have, that would have begun to die out. And I think the Scientologist, Scientologist would have said, he was sort of going through some kind of auditing and the response was being decreased from his reactive mind. Exactly. So once it's going like this, which they call a floating needle, that means it's erased. That's what they say. Um, thank you for telling us that. Thank you. So, has, there, has there ever been any sort of, well, whatsoever, any sort of scientific test done to the e-meter to see if it works? God, no. Hubbard never had any scientific tests of anything. And in fact, you'd be sent to ethics for asking that very question. <laughs> <laughs> Get out! Sure, <laughs> Quit questioning us. Ask, it would be the first thing that probably everybody who's a member of Sadari would ask, where is the proof? Where is the scientific investigation? Where is the data? I know, but that's, that's people that are thinking. Data. You know, you wouldn't be in there. Yeah, okay. Now, <laughs> so. I'll let you, just one quickie. You talk about the people who get in and have to spend money going up. What happens to a poor guy like me who probably would spend all his money at the top, bottom level, wouldn't have anything more to give him? Well, there's one of couple of things. One, they could sign you up for staff, which, you know, it's like, what are you doing to help mankind? We really need, you know, we need you. I mean, we're going to all these other countries, and you'd be perfect. In fact, we think you could run the bridge publications. You might be a perfect manager for that. And people are like, well, okay, I'll do it. You know what I mean? And now you're thinking, and when they get you on the staff, you're thinking, and that's the billion-year contract, right? And they're thinking... Wow, you know, I'm going to have a luxury accommodations and all the auditing and training and everything else for free. The truth is they get paid $35 a week. They work 24-7. It's like a slave camp. And then as soon as you do anything that they don't like, they put you on what they call the RPF, the Radio Pelletation Project Force, and it is like a slave camp. And you can't get out. Some of my friends, I mean, some of the stories of people that have gotten out of there, it's really scary. Anyway, did that answer your question? Okay, yes. 
when I was a youngster in Phoenix. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, he, he I know, I'm kidding. He was a charming fellow. Right. And, um, I seem to recall that he had just gotten out of a uh, U.S. government uh, military. Yeah, vet, a veterans hospital. A, uh, a labor camp, a, uh, a uh, low facility uh, criminal uh, camp, I believe up in Phoenix, Arizona. And your question is? Is, is that the truth? You know, I'm not an expert on L. Ron Hubbard. I would suggest you read uh, L. Ron Hubbard. The best one is Barefaced Messiah, which is written by a guy who wasn't even in Scientology or anything. The other one that's really good is uh, L. Ron Hubbard, Messiah or Madman. Those two have really good information about it. I would read those. They're on the internet. You can, you can download them from Xenu.net, Xenu which is xenu.net. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, well, the galvanic skin response is incorporated into the lie detector test. Right. So it's obviously something. No, I'm not saying it's nothing. I'm not saying it's nothing. I'm just saying, you know, the... W Okay. I'm interested in doing that, by the way. Okay, then swing on by. But I'm just saying there's... Well, I, I swung by Scientology, but... Uh, there's a whole organization that's out where it's much less money. You don't have to do any of the abusive stuff, and you can do that. Oh, what do they call that? See? They call it the free zone. Free zone. Yeah, you can look it up on the Internet, the free oh, zone. Right. Yeah. Uh, and the scientific community and so forth is looking at the results that have raised serious doubts about their validity. Right, because it's kind of like a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. Anyway. Pardon me? You have to have a calibration, you have to have tests, tests which are repeatable that show conclusions, and none of that's ever been done. Exactly. Yes. Are the people who run this organization, the top guys, are they true believers or are they outright charlatans? Jesse Prince, who was at the top with them, left. And I, that's a good question. When Hubbard died, I'm going to tell you what happened. Because we were at the Palladium in Hollywood. And, and L. Ron Hubbard had died, right? That's all we heard. They announced it at the Palladium. And what they said, instead of he died, he decided he couldn't do all the research with his body. So he had to drop his body and he's moved on to do higher research for all of you. <laughs> And I'm like in the audience going, what? You know, it's just... Exactly. So he moved on, and they said L. Ron Hubbard wanted Pat and Annie Broker to take over the Church of Scientology. But all of a sudden, the stage, there's this little switching, and now David Miscavige is there, this little short, kind of skinny, wimpy guy, and he's the authority, right? And there's this big, like, don't ask, don't tell. Don't say anything, right? And it's like... So for years, this was in 86. I didn't find out till 2000. I escaped out. And in 2000, I sat down with Jesse and I said, what happened? How did David Miscavige take over the church? And he said, you want to take over? You want to hear it? And he had a martini. He was really funny. He goes, let me tell you the story. He's a very funny guy. And he said, uh, basically, Hubbard in the 80s, I think, no, no. I think it was in the 70s. 70s, 80s, I may have the time wrong. But anyway, he had basically said, I'm done with the Church of Scientology, moved up to his ranch. I think he wasn't feeling too good. He, was try he had gotten kind of caught in his own little, pardon my language, but bullshit story, right? With Xenu and all that, right? And he was trying to fight off these body thetans that are connected to Xenu, the evil warlord, which was 75 million years ago. The evil warlord named Xenu trying to handle overpopulation on another planet called Tijiak to handle it, murdered all these people, blew them up in, in volcanoes, put, <laughs> it's so hard to remember, I'll put them in these DC-8s, which they had on Tijiak 75 million years ago, flew them over, oh yeah, flew them over to the volcanoes, put them in it, blew them up, and then their spirits went up, stuck on all these electronic strips, and those strips they flew over, put in theaters, and they, you're implanted with all the religious stuff from church and God and Jesus and all that stuff. For, so for they, trying to say they're a religion and they're equal to Christianity, type in Hubbard plus Christianity and listen to some of the quotes this guy said. It was like very strange, but now I forgot where I was again. Where was I? I was somewhere important. The story of the switch. 
Yeah. Okay, so so how did I get a fund of Zenu? I, I, this is part of Scientology. You get kind of screwed up, and especially having the seizures. They made me have all these seizures, and my, my short-term memory is all screwed up. So, that's a good question. So you get on it, and you truly believe it. Like for me, the doctors don't really know what causes epilepsy, right? So this was truly for me. They hand me a pack. They go, okay, here's your secret pack. Go into the room and read it. And so now you have to remember you've talked to thousands of people by now that are going, oh my God, OT3 is so great. Wait till you get on it. You know, I healed this and I fixed that and I can fly. And you know what I'm not really, but you know what I mean? All this stuff that they could do. So I get my pack, I'm all ready to find out what is so great about this OT3. And you have to jump through a lot of hoops to get on it. You have to be invited on it now, written, a written invitation. So you know, you really have to like I, I gave this example, like, what is your name? Joanne. So the, the, this is what they would do. Like, Joanne, come on over here. We think you're ready for OT3. Like, probably most of these people, they're not going to make it. They're not upstat enough, but I think you are. And I think you're ethical enough. And we just, you need to see the registrar, and then we're ready to get you on it. Do you see what I mean? And you're like, wow, really? Me out of all these people I'm picked? I mean, it's not literally like that, but it almost has that feeling where it's sort of like, well, okay. So now they give me the pack. I go into a room. In 79, it was like a little closet, right? And I walk in the room. I open it up. And it's handwritten by Hubbard. 75 million years ago. Oh, first of all, he says, and I better say it here, you could get pneumonia if you hear about this before you're ready. So if you want to leave now, <laughs> you can all leave. So he says that about, I nearly died out in a ship doing this research and... You know, I, I was like so close to it and I nearly died. And that was it for me. Because I, when I was in high school, remember I was in, my parents moved from Park Ridge to Lake Forest. I lost all my friends. Now I'm with the top of the scale of money, right? And I'm going, there must be something more. I start studying Buddhism, Taoism, stuff like that. I'm looking for a higher power and I get epilepsy. And I start having these seizures. And he's talking about how he nearly died because he got real close to the truth. And I thought, oh, that's it. This is why I have these seizures because of these body thetans all covering me. Right? Because that's what he said. The guys that are on the electronic strips, they put them over in the theaters, then they let them out into the universe, and they're all covering you. All your problems are because you're stuck with all these body thetans. They're stuck all over you, and they're unconscious too. So you have to go locate them in session, solo, all by yourself, find them run this really weird process on him and get rid of him, right? It's very strange. But I believed it so much. I mean, at first, my first, did anybody read the book Blink in here? It's a really good book on your own instincts, your personal instincts. My first instinct was, what? Xenu the evil warlord? But then the second thing was, like they talk about in Blink, just because nobody's read it, in the Getty Museum, they had a statue, right? And they thought it was from another century. And they were positive. They had it for a year studying it. And then finally a guy walked in and he said, that was never in the ground, it's a phony. So they went to the guy that bought it and they said, what did you first think when you bought this thing? And he said, you know what, my first instinct was it's a phony. And that's kind of, see my first instinct when I saw Scientology, it was like, whoa, you know, Nazi Germany with the big picture and the uniforms and the organization. But then I went out and saw my friend, got stoned, came back. Now I'm stoned, and he's like, yeah, I don't like the picture either. I don't like those uniforms. Don't worry about it. Let's go meet the auditors. And meeting the auditors, I was like, wow. And that was the second I remember to this day. I turned off my critical thinking, and I thought, you know, I don't care what these people believe. They're so nice. I want to be like them. And that was the beginning of me just literally shutting down my life, right? Because now once you're in, you're in. But good things did happen too. One of the good things was, and I wasn't a big druggie, but I was into drugs. And I, even though people may say, oh, cool, she was into drugs. But it's like, it's a, it's a long, deep path. You know what I mean? It's not a good road. And so for me, it was a good thing. Because as soon as I got in, they said, we don't do drugs. They were totally drug free. And in a way, that's good. In a way, that's bad. For me, it was good because I stopped doing any, you know, any kind of street drugs. But I ended up having to fight them for 30 years with my medicine. And truly, I'm probably free because of my mother and my medicine, because of having to fight them and all the other abusive things, me having access to them. As you get higher up, 
So you get more roped in and you get more cut off. It's really weird. Like you can't talk to people you, and it's more serious. I mean, it's just unbelievable. The confidentiality by the time you get up to the top where like Tom Cruise is, I mean, just to get in the door. You know how you have a keypad? They have a drill on how to press your keypad numbers in. And if anybody ever sees you press a number, right to ethics, honey, you're off the level. You got to redo all the conditions to get back in. It's amazing. Anyway, yes? Can you get back to how that, uh, whoever it was, took over the organization? And David Miscavige. So, ba I, oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, basically, what happened is he, Hubbard moved up to the ranch and he said, Look, I'm sick of this. Bring me a million dollars a week, right? <laughs> so, David Miscavige and a couple other guys, Jesse being one of them, would hustle over to Vegas, they'd party. And then they'd go to the ranch, give him the, hundred, uh, the million bucks. He'd open up the suitcase of his cash, see it's there, close it, put it next to his bed. They'd go back to L.A. And this was a weekly thing, right, with the bucks. So now Hubbard dies. Now we don't know whether they killed him or whether he really died. I don't know. But what happened is Miscavige, this is what Jesse told me, and Jesse was way at the top with him. Miscavige said, either you get the hell out of here and never come back or I, personally, am going to put you in prison for the rest of your life for transporting money and never paying taxes on it. So David Miscavige took over, and he's really a creepy guy. A lot of people have left now. I mean, I, I dealt with him just because of being at the, at the top, not one-on-one, -on -one, but just all the stuff he did to us. But uh, a lot of people that are Sea Org members now are out, and he is now beating up people, you know, which is like physical abuse. And I met a guy at a party, and he's like 6'2", and David Miscavige is a little guy, and nothing against short people, because this guy's short inside and out. Do you know what I mean? He has no strength. He's just a weasel, right? And so I said to this guy, I don't get it. You're, you know, you're a big guy. How could David Miscavige beat you up? And he said, well, first of all, remember the cult mindset, and remember he always comes with big, strong guys with him. So there you go. So that's how he took over. How many people were involved in this? The, that, that when they had the most people, about how many people were parishioners? Or it was mobbed. I mean, in L.A. there were tons of people. It was really fun. You know, in the old days it was... How many? How many? I don't have an exact figure, but I would, they say 8 million. eight million. I don't think it's really 8 million, but I think they did have lots. They did have millions. Now I think they probably have... Maybe 100,000 that are active. They're, they're, are they petering out now? Oh, way, because of the Internet. See, a totalitarian organization only has power when it has secrecy, and you yeah. can't get to the information. Yeah. With the Internet, we can all go to it and find out the other side. Can they give us hope from some of the other churches? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you go with that one. <laughs> yes? What's the deal with the, is it Miscavige's niece speaking of? Right, Jenna. What's that all about? Well, thanks to Anonymous... Uh, they, with 10,000 people speaking out and kind of being there, it's like having, this is how I look at it, it's like having this huge mob of bodyguards, you know, that'll help you, right, and strength. And so she decided to speak out, and she's, he's disconnected from her, and he's disconnected from his own brother. So now Jenna and Astra Woodcraft, who's a girl, another young lady who was in their Sea Org, they now have a thing where if you get pregnant, you're not allowed to have children, because all the kids ended up joining gangs, so they put in forced abortions, which you don't know about when you're in either. But I found out when I left. And so she got pregnant to get out of the Sea Org, because she knew she couldn't get out any other way. So she got pregnant. So it's Jenna, Astra, and then Kendra, Kendra Wiseman, who's par who her parents are like, way, they're public, but they're way high in the church. And uh, they disconnected from her also. So the three of those girls started a website called xscientologykids.com, and it's great. It's really good. I highly recommend you go read it. xscientologykids.com. Yeah. Along those lines, do you believe there's a target population? Are they going after youth? Are they going after good question? Like good question. Mm -hmm. Good what question. Okay, the three major targets that they have are number one, children, young people, not children, but young people, because they can get them into their sea orgs and turn them into their slaves, right? I, I would say number one really is business people because they have money. Anybody with money, they're after. Anybody. 
Number two are artists, musicians who are successful, or they think they can turn them into success. Because someone asked me that, like, why do artists get into Scientology? Well, if you've ever lived in Los Angeles, if you have any clue of how L.A. is, it's like you walk in as an artist, nothing, and they're like, come see us when you're a star. We don't have time. That's literally how they are. I've been to parties with people in the industry, with people that wanted to get going in it. They don't have time. Once you, you have to make it, and then they have time, right? But Scientology, Yvonne Jentz, who was a very wonderful lady. She was in the Sea Org, but she was a very wonderful lady. And she truly and honestly believed everybody was an artist in their own way. And I, I do believe she really, in her soul, believed that. Because everybody loved her. I mean, she was just a wonderful person. And she got all, a lot of the celebrities that are in, are in because of Yvonne. Because she, she's dead now. She passed away. But she was such a kind person, and she believed in people so much. And she was so kind. And she would have these meetings with artists, and it was like, anybody, you know, if you want to do it, come on in. We'll help you, right? Whereas in L.A., nobody else is going to help you, right? So they kind of have captured that audience. And that's, that's where they go with it. They don't know, again, you're getting onto this mind control train. You're going to be getting all the money, money, money. And as you get to the top, you know, you're so much in the Truman Show, you can't question it. You know, like you guys are used to asking for proof, for questions, for what's the science. They, they can't do that. Yeah. Is there someone else? Do celebrities have to continue giving money? Oh, definitely. Tom Cruise just gave a million, or John Travolta just gave a million dollars to handle Anonymous and the critics. And Nancy Cartwright, who's the voice for Bart Simpson, gave over a million bucks. Ten million. Ten million? Ten million. Wow. Oh, God, it's sad. You know, when you think of, like, uh, I think of all the money we gave, over $200,000, and we're just like regular people. And that was just part of it. That was our inheritance. And my mother-in-law, because they got in in 1950, she was way at the top of the triangle and said, well, we're going to put all your inheritance into Scientology so you can have the whole bridge. Yeah. I think I read in Time Magazine that said that, that Tom Cruise was, was gay and the uh, Scientologist uh, uh, took over his management so they could they can change trades and I've heard that. I don't know. I mean, I, I'll tell you something. Tom Cruise is so suit crazy. I'm not going to get into that question. You know, that's something you can read up on. I know that uh, there are some people that are gay in Scientology, some celebrities that are gay, and they're very, very weird on it. They, you know, now they're trying to be friends with gays because they realize they have money and they have connections. So it's like, we're friends with the gays. But Hubbard, I know exactly how they feel about it, because Hubbard said anyone with a chronic illness or a homosexual are what they call 1-1, one -one, which is covertly hostile, which just get a picture of somebody smiling and jabbing you in the back. I'm not covertly hostile. You can see, if anything, I'm hostile. If I'm ticked <laughs> off, I'm going to tell you how I feel, right? I'm from Chicago. But... Uh, they, they run that on gays, and then they say, there's something wrong with you, you need to get auditing. One of our friends who's OT8 and left, which is above OT7 where I was, gave over a million bucks and finally left. And, you know, there you go. You know, yes? How many ships in the sea are That's a good question. There used to be, he used to have a flotilla of, you know, the Apollo. I was on the Boulevard, which is just some tanker out in L.A. Harbor. And then... Uh, now they only have the free winds, and that's even in dry dock right now because I don't think they have that many people going. See, they used to have all of Europe that would fly to Clearwater, Florida, and a lot of the Europeans would send their children there for the whole year. When I was there, there'd be tons of kids that were there all year. But once they started waking up, the critics started making these websites, and they started realizing, and they've been through this drill before with Germany, right? And they were like, uh-uh, not on our watch. And now it's, none of them are going there. So... Yes. So talk a little bit more about how you got out. Okay, good question. All right, so I got to the top, right? And for me, you know, that's part of a cult. You're always working, at least in Scientology. Hubbard was always doing his research. And it was very exciting in the beginning days because it was like, wow, you know, okay, this didn't work, but the next thing will work. You know, and this thing didn't work, but the next thing will work. You know, and anyway, we're going, going, going. Finally, I get to OT7. He's already dead now. Miscavige has taken over. It doesn't work at all for me. At all. I wrote him a letter saying, I feel like a being trapped inside of an iceberg as big as the Grand Canyon, and I'm trying to use a toothpick to get out. This doesn't work. Let me off. 
and they wouldn't. They just kept saying, okay, continue, okay, continue, meaning you have to continue. Like seven's your only alternative to fix you. And I was on it for seven years. Yes? Yeah, for someone logical, that's a good question. For someone in a Truman Show, it's not. You know, I mean, they would send me to correction. They sent me every time. I'd say, I can't heal people. I'm really ticked off because this guy, I would hear these wins about how this guy healed everybody, right? So I was sure by the time you got on seven, you could heal everybody. So when I got on, there was nothing about healing. And I said to the lady, because they had part A, B, and C. So I was in A, and that was, I did that. B, there was nothing about healing in that. Wait till you get to C. I get to C, and it's like, find out who these BTs are. That's the question for part C. I said, I looked, I said, what the hell is this? I said, where's the thing on healing people? She said, send her to cramming right away. They sent me up to correction, get, get her in the secret room. What's wrong? There's something wrong with me. I said, where's the thing on healing? You know, you got, you know I thought OT7, you could heal people. Tori, here's the pack. That's what it says. That's it. There's nothing on it, right? It's like find these stupid BTs, find out what they are, the body thetans. Remember, the BTs are the body thetans that are the things that he blew up, they got on the electronic strip, and you're covered with them, and that's... They're just these fake things that they said you're covered with. They're not really... I don't think they're real. I think they're just fake things that, you're, that they say you have, like, Hubbard, like the reactive mind. I mean, think of how ironic that is. Hubbard says you have a reactive mind, you know what clear is? When you realize I'm creating my own reactive mind. And they go, would you like to attest to clear? You're like, wait a minute, what did I just say? I've been on this for months. You know, but you don't want to say that because then they'll put you back in session, right? So it's like, okay, sure, I'll attest to clear, right? But, you know, it's very, you know, like the body Satan thinks you read it and you're covered with them, so that's the way it is. So now you're in session trying to locate these body Satans and they got to read on the meter and you got to get rid of them and you got to keep doing this until I'm free of them. See? Yes? So you got to this point where you were butting up against reality. Was there a time where you sort of realized you're going to have to walk completely away from your whole life? No. That never happened. What happened is this. I got, as I was, I was on OT, from 1990 to 2000, a lot of stuff happened for me. And I don't have time. It's another hour's worth of stuff. But a lot of abusive things I was ob observing. They had asked me to open up these phony accounts. My best friend, who I trusted as much as my husband, he, he said, I need you to open up these accounts to handle the critics on the Internet. Now, I didn't know anything about the Internet at the time, so I did. I went out and opened them, and I said, what are you going to do with them? And he goes, I can't tell you, because they'll put you in deposition, and you'll never get out. So just open them up, and we'll handle it. But I'm from Chicago, I've been around the mafia, and they started acting really mafia-like. And I thought, something is really wrong here. Now they had brainwashed me so much, and every Scientologist, they won't, they're terrified to look on the internet. And I know that's really funny, but it's true. And so I wasn't looking on the internet. One of my girlfriends did go insane, and she was climbing out the windows of her house. But later I found out they had drugged her and reverse audited her, right? So it wasn't like she just went insane from reading the net, right? But I thought they did, and that's what my friend said. So he got me to go out and open those accounts. And these are like accounts that are foreign? They're just phony accounts that then they're using on a news group where people were speaking out against Scientology. They were spamming it, and their thing was if they can get everything down the first page, nobody will read it. Sure. Hang on a second, because I'm not going to remember her thing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so now, see, I already forgot it. What, what's your question? Just um, getting out. Okay, in view of the fact that... The internet is where the anti-Scientology stuff seems to be well-centered. Uh, and they're now trying to focus target group homosexuals, and the homosexual population is very heavily internet. How would they possibly attempt to... Uh, There's no homosexuals that are going to go... Homosexuals are all the internet. They're not going to go anyway. I'm just telling you that's one of their new BS things, but they're not going to go. They're not stupid. You know, people read the internet now. They're not, you know, the only people that are giving them a lot of money are these guys that are already in, right? The new people, they're not getting it. I'm just telling you they're trying to. It's another thing where that's a new door that they, they've even bent, right? That they used to never even bend. But as far as me waking up, I opened those phony accounts. Then they turned on me. I, once I went on the internet and saw that they were spamming the internet and stopping free speech, I said, I can't do that. And I called up my friend. 
He said, oh, okay, that's fine. Come on over to our house. We're going to just have a little meeting. You can tell us what, what happened. And they just turned on me. I mean, it was just horrible. It was like two, three hours of them screaming at me, all men. And I just ran out. I said, that's it. That's it. That's it. Right? And I had to have already signed the thing so I'd never tell anybody, not even the top execs in Scientology or my husband or my friends. So I had no one. So now I'm on the internet trying to help John Travolta. This is kind of a funny story because he was in Battlefield Earth. Any of you saw that? It's a horrible movie. Even we in Scientology thought it was horrible. But, but we did. But I like Travolta. I trained him. I helped train him, even though Scientology says I didn't. He came up and gave me a hug at Battlefield Earth and said he'll never forget me. So that's what he said. So screw them. Screw you, Scientology. But anyway, I felt bad for him. So I'm on the Internet. And remember, at this point, I know nothing about the Internet, really literally nothing. So I go on this little me. It's like a, what do you call it, message board, Yahoo message board. And Mark's on it. And it's Xenu TV. And Xenu is a top confidential word. You have to get rid of that. So I'm calling him names, trying to change his name, all this other stuff. And finally, I get ticked off. And, I, and I'm in sales. I've been in sales for years. So I call up Warner Brothers, and I say, I'm a mom. I'm a fan. I'm down the street. And I'm really upset that you have all this anti-religious stuff on your website about Battlefield Earth. I want it taken down. So the guy says, OK. So the next day, this guy calls me from New York. And he says, this is you know, John Smith from New York. And uh, we got your message, and we're taking down the message board. And I'm like, wow. You know, to me, it was like, just like, really? I was, like, amazed, right? And to me, that little message board was equal to this news group, which I don't know how to explain the comparison. Do you guys know the difference in a message board and a news group? Everybody does. But I didn't. See, I thought, like, it's sort of like a little local paper or your San Diego Times, right? You know, that's the difference. You know, and it, the other one, no way am I going to get it stopped. But I thought they were the same. So now I go on to alt-religion Scientology, and at that point, I had to be just nuts. I think I knew the critics knew something I needed to know, but I couldn't admit to myself they know something. Do you see what I mean? So I was just like, well, I'll go on and fight them. So I'm on there making all these just knucklehead you know, posts. Just, I made 4,000 posts in four weeks. Now, one of their big enemies is Andreas, who's from Norway. He has xenu.net, xenu.net. That's his website, right? He's a computer guy. He had gone on in the 90s, found there was all kinds of information around the net about Scientology, but nothing coordinating it. So he made this Xenu.net, right? And I had seen it, thought, wow, this guy's really like the devil, right? So he comes on while I'm posting. And if you post on a news group, like if you said something, you say something, and then there's some arrows, right? And then I say something. Well, all I knew how to do was copy-paste. So I would copy-paste it, and I'd think, oh, who needs all these arrows? And I'd erase them all, right? So no one could understand what I was saying. So Andreas sent me an email saying, Tori, or Magoo, my nickname's Magoo on the internet. And he said, and he thought I was a guy. Everybody thought I was a guy because I was like, you know, screw you and all this stuff. And he said, uh, look, look, man, nobody can understand what you're saying. You know, here, let me teach you how to format something. And I, it was such a shock to me. And people always say that. What can we do with Scientologists or anybody in a cult? But I mean, that was the biggest thing that ever, I mean, it just totally rocked my boat that this devil Help me. Do you see what I mean? He didn't tell me about Hubbard. He didn't tell me about Paulette Cooper or all, you know, them killing Lisa McPherson. He helped me on my computer, right? And my mom always said, if somebody helps you, send him a thank you note, right? And he had that little blue. See, this is their downfall because you, before you had to go, you know, leave Scientology, meet with a, a suppressive person. Now you're in doubt. You know, it's like all these bad things happen. <laughs> But now I'm just in my dining room with my little computer, and there's that little blue link, which is his email address, right? So I click on it. Now it's like Tori talking to a suppressive person. And I'm really scared. And I'm like, dear Andreas, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Magoo, right? And so he writes back, and he goes, dear Magoo, you're welcome, Andreas. But on the bottom, he has his complete address, his phone number, his email his cell phone number. Now, we at the top that were in the top secret mafia were always using phony names, phony addresses. Bill Yachty, my friend, had said, never call me Bill on the phone. Call me Jack, because you know, they might be listening in, right? You know, so we were just like these chronic liars all the time. So now, here's Andreas in Norway with his, everything's out there, right? And I'm like, wow. So maybe, maybe I can talk to this guy and handle him, right? Because he's really this big devil, right? So I say, dear Andreas, you know, like, why do you have up all this stuff about my religion? And he writes me back and he says, dear Magoo, 
I believe in truth. I believe in looking at both sides. I believe in having the courage to say what I think. I don't think Scientologists are bad. I just think they're misinformed. Best wishes, Andreas. And I, I, I swear to God, I sat in my dining room and I cried for about three hours. I couldn't stop crying. I was just like weeping and weeping and weeping. Because it was like my little Truman Show. I didn't even realize it was a Truman Show until he said that. And then I realized that was who I was at 22 when I got in. I believed in truth. I believed, in, just like you people, I believed in looking at both sides, right? I believed in proof. I believed in everything, right? I did still have courage, right? But now I'm at the top, and I can't talk to people. I can't read books. I can't watch the television on certain stations. You know, it's like everything's self-centered, uh, censored as you get higher up. And I was just, like, so sad. And I said, Andreas, you know, I wrote him, and I said, I, you know, I'm, like, terrified. I don't know what to do. I mean, I have no one, every person I know in my life, Everyone is a Scientologist. I have no one. Not a soul. I can't tell my husband. I can't tell my girlfriends. I can't tell anybody. If I walk into Scientology, it's going to be a nightmare. So he wrote me back and he said, I'm crying reading your email. I'm really sorry you're having to go through this. But I've got to ask you this one question. What kind of friends could those be if they're going to leave you because you changed your mind? And for you guys, that's a good question, huh? That was it for me. That cracked open my Truman Show. It was like sunshine came in. It was like I realized he's right. They're only my friends as long as I jump through the hoops. So then I wrote him and said, you know, I've got to talk to somebody that's, that's a Scientologist that left, right? So he hooked me up with these Lisa McPherson Trust, which was Bob Minton, Stacy Brooks, Jesse, Mark. They were all over in Clearwater, Florida helping families, right? So they said, look, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know, Stacy. I don't know. And she said, why don't you just come here and rest for a week? And I said, okay. So they said, we'll get you a ticket. Just go to the airport. So at this point, remember I said it's like that black sheet? You know, I just totally am positive they don't do fair game. And she says, bring a cell phone. I said, Stacy, they don't do stuff like that. I know they don't. She said, Tori, we used to run these programs bring a cell phone. And this is before everybody had cell phones, right? I had my emergency cell phone. So I bring my little phone thinking, you know, I'm going to need that. It's like, just think of a black sheet, right? And I call the van and say, I need a ride to the airport. Okay, tomorrow, 8.30. 8.30 comes, no, no cab. 9 o'clock comes, they're not there. I call them up, what's going on? Some anonymous person called in and canceled your cab. And that was like a pinhole in that black sheet of like, oh, my God, do they do this? So long story short, I finally get to the airport. The, the plane is canceled. Now I'm like, can they cancel a plane? <laughs> I'm amazed. And I'm standing there, and all of a sudden the vice president comes up and goes, we know exactly where you're going. You're not going to go talk to those people. You're not going to go see those people. And I got my little cell phone out, and I go, Stacy, she's here. The vice president's here, right? And she puts on Jesse, who was way up with Miscavige. And Jesse says, stay on the phone. We are going to walk you through this. Do not set down that cell phone, right? And so she's following me around, now carrying my luggage, right? Because I'm trying to hold the cell phone in my purse and all this other stuff. So she's carrying my luggage, following me. And I have to get on a van to go to another terminal. And I'm like, I'm really sorry, man, to the bus driver. I say, look, you know, I'm trying to escape from a cult. She's the vice president. She won't leave me alone. Yeah, I'm trying to get rid of her. She won't leave, right? But I realized later she had orders to follow me around, get where I was going. I tell Bob she won't leave me alone. He's a very wealthy guy, really cool guy. And he said, I'm going to get you a first-class ticket. You can go in a special lounge. You can't get there. So I go in the lounge. I get on the plane. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm just completely fried. I mean, this has just been, like, so incredible to me, right? It's, like, so unplanned. That's why when you said it, I was, like, so unplanned. It was like a frying pan hitting me in the face, and now I'm here. I'm on the plane, like, oh, thank God. Okay, no problem. Now I just got to go to Clearwater, and I'll talk to these people. Wrong. I get off in Chicago to train, change planes. Up comes my husband. Tori, what are you doing here? What could you be doing in Chicago? I'm like, what are you doing here? <laughs> He's like, I just happen to be here. I'm like, uh-huh, sure, right. You just happen to be here. He's like, we need to go on a vacation. Well, vacation for Scientology, and I don't even know if he knows this to, that day, to this day, but they, I knew. He didn't know about all the secret stuff I knew. He didn't know about it. 
But I knew about it, and I knew they knew I knew about it, and I knew they were going to probably lock me up in a cabin in Wisconsin and do, I don't know what they would do. I don't. But I knew I wasn't going there. And I said, get away from me. Just get away. So then OSA comes up with the secret police, with all these papers. And they're like, you're not going. And I'm like, get away from me, all of you. And in Scientology, it's like against the rules. They ever call the police. You can never go to the court. You can never use any legal systems, only Scientology. But I said to him, you get away from here, I'm going to call the police. To my husband and to Osa. And to my husband, if you're watching this, you know what? Ugh, he really irritates me. <laughs> he does. You know, that he's still in that stupid thing. He should know better. But anyway, and same for all my friends. But long story short, I get on the plane. I knew in Clearwater they only go, the buses only go till midnight. Wrong. I get off at 145. There's like this huge mob of people, friends of mine in Osa. The police and Stacy, Bob, and Jesse, who right before this are like the Draculas in my life, right? You know, I'm there, these evil, horrible people. Well, now they're helping me, right? And I walk off, my friends going, Tori, Tori, Tori! And I go over to see her for a minute. Now, the only person I'm leaving for at that point wasn't Hubbard, it wasn't Attack, it was David Miscavige. That was it, because he basically screwed all of us on seven. And I thought, you know what, screw this, I'm done. And so I left, and he was running all those programs with OSA and stuff. So I leave, and she goes, I'm best friends with David Miscavige. I can get him a message tonight. And the cop had said, stand back, everyone. She has to pick. She has to pick. And so I'm like, I listened to her for a minute, and then I went, I picked them, right? <laughs> and so the cop holds all of them. We walk out. I say, I've got luggage. He goes, we'll get it. They went down and got the luggage, held us in this police thing. We get on a separate van. We go to a hotel. And, you know, that was it. I'm out. I'm free. They, they flew in my husband. They flew in my auditor. They st that was really funny. That's a whole other story. But anyway, they flew us in. I basically, at the time, had said to Stacy, I'm not going to pick it. I'm not going to speak out. I'm not going to do any demonstrations. I'm just coming to kind of think this through. And she said, Tori, I'm only doing for you what I wish someone had done for me, right? But then, you know, it was like one of those things where they just kept picking on me. And that's why, really, with Magoo dancing in Boston, that's when I decided, you know what? I have a voice, I have free speech, and I got an awful lot to stay. <laughs> yes? Just a quick question. I know we're getting close to the time. What can we tell people who are thinking about, oh, I heard about this new thing at Scientology. Do you want to check it out? Like, what do we tell people to, other than stay the F away? What can we tell them? that will make these people realize it's a cult, it's dangerous, stay away. Well, what I always say is this. I, I, I talk to a lot of people all the time, and a lot of people are in the same boat. They don't really know, or they might... Like one kid pulled over, as an example. He was on his way to give them $10,000, and he, he saw us picketing. And he says, is there anything you can say? And I said, sure, pull over, right? And within about two minutes, he, was, he, he said, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough. But, you know, I just said it's a cult, man. They're going to take your money. They don't deliver what they promise. I've been all the way to the top. It doesn't work. You know, it's, it's, it's a con. But what you could say is learn both sides before you go. Because once you go, you can't learn both sides. And that's what I think would be the best thing. That's what I say. Don't believe me. You know, go on the net and study their side. Study the other side and make up your own mind. Because if you, st see, they can never say that. I say it all the time. Look at both sides, make up your own mind. All the time. They can never say that. They just say, look at our side, look at our side, look at our side. And you can even ask someone, why do you think it is that they don't want you to look at both sides? Right? Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Yes. Are there any, uh, I never hear of any components of Scientology that have a relationship with traditional religion. Do they, oh, no. I mean, are there, are there any, is the concept of, of God or, or, no. or any other traditional religious terms part of it? No, it's Xenu. You know? I mean, it's Xenu and Hubbard. You know, it's like L. Ron Hubbard. They, they say, they, they'll lie through their teeth and say, and I did too, so I can say it from experience. I said, oh, I'm a Catholic and a Scientologist. Did I ever go to a Catholic service in my life? No. Not since I... Are there any kinds of organized services or... They started having Sunday service because they looked so weird not having them, but they only have them for PR reasons. They only go out with their yellow tents to help out as volunteers for PR reasons. Now, the people helping don't know that, and I only connected the dots because I was one of the people out helping, and I would, every time I would come back, the only thing they would say is, do we get any press? 
That was it. And after a while, it was like, don't you even care about these people? You know, you never ask about the people. And I finally asked him once, because I was very concerned about the homeless. And I said, what about all these homeless people? What? What are we going to do about them? And they said, you know what? We don't have time for them. Next lifetime. That's what they said. True story. What's the deal with the billion-year contract? Suckers you in. You know, it's just another way of, you know, and they, and they expect it. You know, it's just another tra entrapment. And it's kind of like mystical, like part of cultures. They always have something mystical, and they're like, ooh, a billion no, years. They do believe yeah. That's not quite as good as eternity. No, thank you. That's a good point. Yes, sir. What happens on the Sea Org? In the Sea Org? You work 24 7. It's like hard labor. You know, you're working. Huh? Well, they, you know, they have people, they have different things. You can go out and, you know, do the stress test. You can be an auditor. You can, you know, compile books. You know, they have all kinds of stuff that you work on to create Scientology and keep it going, keep the organization going. Is that good? Are you okay? All right. Thank you. I hope it helps. One, one nice thing about Tori is... She, there's just no place where you can say stop. I'm not, I'm not stopping. <laughs> I know. Because uh, she was run out of ideas, but we have to close the doors I know. sometime this evening. I hear I, you. Uh, I, uh, well, it's a great risk, audience. The risk of going beyond just being a skeptic and perhaps being a cynic, I think anytime you say what, why, or where's the proof, uh, you're going to have a hell of a time getting by most most religions anyway. True. But that's that's a question for a different one. We're going to have all of them up here. Uh, you know, there's 1,500 different religions. We'll examine them all. <laughs> In this week. <laughs> Thank you very much. Tori. Thank you so wonderful. much. Thank you all of you.